the arsonists had oddly shaped feet. The human torch was denied a bank loan. Hey, January 17th, we got 25 through 29. Vocab review, this is big stuff on research methods. We really need to go over these things. They are important and uh, they will be used throughout these entire semester. So watch this video once or twice and uh, buckle up, here we go. So number one is theory. Theory is just, our book has like a long explanation. It's just our best explanation for something. Best explanation. So best, where are we at here? There we go. Best explanation. My thing's not working. There we go. Um, hypothesis. Uh, all through your elementary school years, you were taught hypothesis is an educated guess, maybe even in junior high, maybe even your freshman year of science. It's not. Cause they lied to you. You've been lied to. A hypothesis is a statement of relationship between two variables. So uh, you, would, you might say, I think that drinking monster energy drinks will increase my awareness during my boring fifth period class. That's a hypothesis. The relationship between the monster and the relationship between your fifth period energy, right? So those are, that would be a hypothesis. It's not an educated guess. It's a statement between a relationship. Um, operational definition. This is one that we go over in class a lot. We have practice about it in class. Operational definition is uh, procedures that you use uh, to define your variables in your research. So, for instance, if I say I want, to, I think that um, blondes are more intelligent than brunette men. All right, so I think blonde is uh, more intelligent, right? All right, now the key here is what is intelligence, right? What's intelligence? Is intelligence being able to solve a puzzle quickly? Is intelligence being able to answer a bunch of random questions about television? Is intelligence being able to solve a puzzle? Is intelligence, what is it? Is it your score on an IQ test? So when we look at intelligence, we have to operationally define, we have to tell exactly what it is. And the reason why we have to do that is so that everybody who reads our research, everybody who's looking at what we've done knows exactly what we're talking about. And so that there's no confusion and that can be replicated, which we talk about next. So that can be replicated and done over again. Um, there's no value on operational definition. It's not good nor bad. The operational definition of stuff is just the um, exact exactly what you're talking about. Now you can argue afterwards whether that was a good operational definition or not, but the operational definition of itself has no value. It simply allows all your terms in your research to be defined. And so it's very important for a good research to have good operational definitions. That's the very first thing that you need to look at when you're coming up, after you've come up with a question or a, something that you want to work on. And in, right, one of the reasons why we do that is so we can replicate it. Replicate it means we, we basically do the same exact procedure, this time using different uh, population, perhaps different groups, and see if these results carry over. Um, yesterday's video mentioned generalizability, and this, uh, by being able to replicate it, will tell us whether or not it's generalizable. And um, so replication is important. If you find something, it should happen every time, or at least every time within that group that you're looking at. <clears throat> okay, next vocabulary word that we talk about is case study. Case study is a type of research where you look at one person or thing or animal in depth. Now, because, be, because you're only looking at one, you can't draw any causation, you can't really correlate anything too well, but it's a nice jumping off point to find other things. Um, you can find a lot of important information by looking at one person. We especially do this when we look at like really good people. People are really good at stuff. So like really good sports coaches or really good presidents will look at their lives in depth and see how they became great. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's how everybody gets great. 
it just means that's how they did and we can use that. Well, if they did that, then let's do some research to see if that works with everybody. If we can replicate those results and generalize them from the last unit to the general population, that's what makes it important. All right, moving right along, we're on to survey. Survey is another type of research where you um, survey, ask questions of multiple people all at once, usually, uh, and it's self-reporting, so they report the results, um, and it's used to, to get information from a large group of people all at once. Um, and you get surveys in the mail, you can have surveys in class, you can have surveys you know, as you're leaving a place, uh, over the phone, and so you get a bunch of information all at once. And it's, the key here is it's self-reporting, which we run we can run into trouble as we move on. We'll talk about why that's uh, could be a, run into a problem, and that it's uh, depending on how you question can affect how people answer, which goes right along with this the wording effect. In a survey, you generally try to get uh, what we're going to see in the next slide: uh, random. You want to have random population surveyed so that you get a good uh, well, there's your word population so you get a good representative sample so you're not just asking all the same types of people so if, if you ask a bunch of athletes whether or not they like baseball you're gonna have a high percentage to say they like the baseball team as you're talking about however if you ask a general population that's not just athletes those numbers might change right because athletes generally gonna like other sports one of the problems with surveys is you have a wording effect so depending on how you ask the question will help determine how people answer the question, interestingly enough, even though they're both basically asking the same thing. So if I ask you, would you like to destroy the house on the corner that's beat down? More people are likely to say, no, I wouldn't, because you use the word destroy, and destroy is kind of a strong word. But if you say, would you like to eliminate or get rid of, maybe those words, I'm sorry, maybe those words increase the percentage of people saying yes I'd like to get rid of it or would you like to um, remove the the eyesore or eliminate the eyesore or whatever but if depending on how you change the word can determine whether or not how people answer and so wording affects a big big important thing uh, when we're talking about surveys you have to make sure that the wording is non like judgmental or non leading because you want people's real answers in there. You don't want them to be led to answer a particular way. Um, population is just the group of people that we're either sampling, that we're looking at, that we're trying to generalize the findings to. So the populations are just groups of people. Whatever group that we're talking about, that's our population. Whatever group that we're working with, that's our population. So our population is whatever group that we're specifically referring to in that instant. Um, when I, observing, I just mentioned, uh, leads us to another type of research, which is a bit like a case study, um, if you're just looking at one person. But naturalistic observation happens when you look at somebody or a group of people or animals uh, in their natural environment. They have to be in their natural environment. The key here is that they you don't want them to know that you're watching. Um, it's not like creeper stuff where you're like stalking them, but you don't want, you want them to act as naturally as possible so you can see how they act in certain situations because we tend to act differently based on who's watching, right? If there's no teacher in the room when there's a test going on, you may unfortunately act differently than you act if the teacher's in the room. So naturalistic observation is how would you act if nobody's watching or at least you don't know anybody's watching you in particular. Um, last are the two kind of the most difficult terms of this unit, random or this section here, random sample and random assignment. These two terms often get uh, confused. I might do an additional video just on these two terms uh, in a bit. A random sample occurs uh, when you get from a, a larger population. So here's all the people in my group. And I want to randomly assign them. Randomly means without any special preference. So I'm going to say every second person that walks through the door, I'm going to get. Okay, so I'm going to get this person, I'm going to get this person, I'm going to get this person, this person, this person, and this person. Now all these people are now all in my research study. Okay, so now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven that were randomly chosen. That's my random sample from all the people available. 
I randomly chose seven by choosing every two that came, every other one that came through the door. Okay, I randomly chose those. You also want them to be representative. That's if you're trying to figure out um, if you're asking questions about high school kids, and you don't want a room just full of boys. You want boys and girls. You want a representative sample of that group that you're trying to look at. So if I want to know about teenagers, I want boys and girl teenagers, not just one or the other, or not mostly one or the other. You want it to represent basically 50-50, because there's basically 50-50 boys and girls. Um, now, the key here is, so you randomly sampled your population here, right? A random, got a random. Now, before you can assign somebody something, you have to have already gotten them. Um, for instance, before I can assign you homework, you have to be in my class. Before I can assign you what to do, you have to be in my study. How do I get you in my study? I have to randomly get a random sample to get you in my study. Now, random assignment occurs when I take these guys and I put this is the the um, like the test group, and this is the pl the placebo or the control group. Control group. This is the group that either nothing's happening to them or they're getting a placebo. And now I take these people here and I will randomly assign them to one of these two groups. So you go here, 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 you go here. So these people are being randomly assigned to different groups. Sometimes there's more than two groups down here. It could be three, four different groups, but you randomly assign them. You can't randomly assign them until you have them in your population and you can't get them in your population until you've taken a random sample so hopefully that helps make a little bit of sense between random sample and random assignment random sample comes first you have to sample your population i have to get a when i'm in a class for psychology i have to get a sample of the students from the school right i have to get a certain number of students it might not be random but i have to get a sample of them and then i in order to assign them something that comes second so sam sampling comes before assigning remember that all right uh, that's all I've got for today.